Yesterday we started talking about Satipatthana Sutta. This is the major discourse that talks about the practice of Satipatthana. So it's very well known, very famous. The different insight meditation methods that we find today all are based on this discourse. The two most important discourses about meditation are Satipatthana Sutta and Anapanasati Sutta. Anapanasati is mindfulness, sati, of in and out breathing, anapana. And as we discussed, this is a practice which is defined by its object. If you're doing mindfulness of breathing, obviously your object is the breathing. Satipatthana is not defined by any particular object. The discourse has 21 sections. Each section goes through a different possibility, a different possible meditation object. And it starts with the breathing. Clearly breathing is, uh, the Buddha considered it quite um, central as a meditation object, but it's not limited to breathing at all. Satipatthana is not defined by any specific object. Any object can be part of Satipatthana. For example, some people here are doing open awareness. When you do open awareness, you sit and you follow whatever happens to be predominant at that moment. It might be the breathing, but it might be something else. It might be the body, but it might be the mind. It might be the same thing all day. It might change every two seconds. But that open practice is included in Satipatthana because any object can be the uh, reference point for Satipatthana. It doesn't matter what the object is. Similarly, Satipatthana is not a particular method. It's not a meditation technique. We've been talking about the Mahasi method. This was developed by Mahasi Sayadaw's teacher, Mingun Sayadaw. And it has quite definite characteristics. The idea of primary object, secondary object. That's the basic structure of this particular practice. But you don't find any mention of primary object and secondary object in the Satipatthana Sutta. It's not confined to that. Using the structure primary object and secondary object is one way to get into the practice of Satipatthana. Open awareness is another way. The Ubakin Goenka method is another way. There are many different techniques which one might use to discover Satipatthana. But Satipatthana is not limited to any particular technique and it's not limited to any particular object. And this gives it a quite unique flavour. We looked at the opening of the discourse. We looked at the idea of the Ekiyano Maggo, the one direction path. Satipatthana, the Buddha sees as a, a way, a path, that leads in one direction only, towards Nibbāna. Later on in the retreat, hopefully we'll talk about Nibbāna itself. You notice that he doesn't call it a method, he calls it a path, a way, manga. Again, it's broader than a technique. And this path is aiming direct for Nibbāna. And this is its importance, its place in the whole system. When the Buddha starts to elaborate, he asks the questions, what are the four? What are the four establishments of mindfulness? And he then describes a practice. Or rather, he describes a practitioner. He talks about the bhikkhu, who, as we discussed yesterday, here means any committed practitioner. So we'll just say practitioner. He describes the practicing practitioner. He says, here a practitioner surrendering longing and dejection 
for the world, lives tracking body as body, ardent, clearly understanding and mindful, surrendering longing and dejection for the world. He lives tracking feeling as feeling. He lives tracking mind as mind. He lives tracking phenomena as phenomena, ardent, clearly understanding and mindful. So you have the same sentence repeated four times for each of the four foundations of mindfulness. Body, feeling, chitta, he translated mind, and phenomena. Tomorrow morning we will have an experiment in Vedana, feeling, the contemplation of feeling. So far we've just been focusing on the body. You have the same practice described for each of the four foundations or domains of mindfulness. Later we'll talk about these four in more detail, but for now, just recognise that these four areas are a way of mapping the entirety of human experience. Everything that we experience is covered in this. Satipatthana is a way of practice in which everything and anything can be a meditation object. And this is very important. It's one of the things which is the the simplest thing about the practice and the most difficult for us to actually accept. For example, with distraction. I can't meditate because dot, dot, dot is happening. People often say this sort of thing. And the assumption behind it is meditation is confined to a certain area of experience and it excludes dot, dot, dot. So if dot, dot, dot is happening, then obviously it's outside meditation and as long as it's happening, I can't meditate. Now, that might fit other approaches to meditation practice, but it does not fit Satipatthana. If that's happening, then dot, 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 is the meditation object. Whatever arises becomes the meditation object. But we resist this very fiercely, I think for two reasons. One is good old-fashioned attachment. We are attached to certain ideas, certain views about meditation practice. We are attached to our distractions. We don't like to get in the way of them by actually looking at them. The classic example I like to cite is for those of you who have had the experience of being distracted by thought, perhaps one or two of you have, but for those of you who have had that experience, you might notice that sometimes it works like this. I'm following the meditation object. Suddenly I'm into thought. Think, 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 think. Suddenly I realise that I'm thinking That takes one nanosecond. In the next nanosecond is the thought, I must get back to my meditation object. And in the following nanosecond is the resolution, I'll just finish this thought off and then I'll go back. Has anybody had that experience? This determination to finish it off is really interesting. And it's particularly interesting when it's a familiar thought. If I'm telling myself a story, I know exactly how it ends, but I have to tell myself one more time. Why? It's attachment. I'm really in love with this story. It's very important to me. It's completely trivial, but it's important to me. There's a deep attraction here. Now, that very attraction is a wonderful object for meditation practice. Why is this thought so sticky? Why can't I let it go? What's the payoff? If I'm hanging on to this, there must be something I'm getting from it. Otherwise I wouldn't do it. So it may be a very painful thought. This thought is terrible. It's about this terrible tragedy of my life. If someone says, oh, you're very attached to that thought, you really love that thought, they'd say, you're crazy. I'd do anything to get rid of this thought, but it just keeps coming back. But of course, that's the point. It would not come back if I was not attached to it. 
and I am getting something out of it. There is a payoff. There is some kind of perverse satisfaction I'm getting from it. Otherwise, I would not keep doing it. Many years ago, when I was in Burma, doing intensive meditation practice, and I used to hear about this idea of you meditate, 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 and you get bliss. And I thought, this is a very good idea. I want my share of bliss. But the problem was, it never came. I got lots of pain, but not much bliss. And every time that bliss arose, or any you know, real, anything pleasant, my response to it, quite immediate, instinctive, was, this won't last. And it didn't. When pain arose, I thought, yep, this is it, this is real, this is me, this will stick around, and it did. And it took me a long time to realise that I was doing it, <laughs> that I was so identified with my own pain that when anything pleasant arose, I simply didn't believe it, and I just got rid of it as fast as I could. When anything painful arose, I believed it, and I hung on to it, because that's where I found my identity. That's where the self was being constructed. We are attached to our distractions, to our hindrances. We love them. That's why they keep running along. But that attachment to them is subtle and hidden. On the surface, I have this me and my drama and this is the world of the self. Underneath it is this attachment to this drama because without it I cannot construct myself. So I, I need it, quite literally, for my existence. We are attached to the things that we think get in the way of the practice. So we don't hear this message that anything can be a meditation object. It just goes past. The other difficulty is that it's quite difficult to deal with some of these meditation objects. For example, the hindrances. It's not easy. It's very difficult. Sometimes what's getting in the way, we can call it a hindrance, obviously, because it's getting in the way, but it can be very subtle, and we just don't know how to work with it. For example, old habits, old mental habits that suddenly come up and take me away. I don't know how I'm supposed to work with this. All I know is that I'm doing my thing and then suddenly this old habit comes up and boom, it takes me away. And you know, I wake up a second later, a minute later, an hour later, a week later, a year later. So how can I work with it? And here we're talking about skill, developing the skill of meditation. To me, meditation is a craft. It's something that we take up and learn over a period of time. It's not something that comes to us immediately. It's like if we take up something like woodwork or take up something like golf or music, we start doing it and we're very bad at it. So if we take up music, if we're playing a musical instrument, our neighbours don't like it at all because they hear the same scales being played the same bad way day after day. Start again. Start again. Drives you crazy. But the person is learning a craft, learning a skill, and it always has a certain quality to it. As we get better at it, what we're doing is always working at a problem. There's some problem here that I'm working at. Uh, there's some difficulty. Something isn't working correctly. I have to fix it somehow or, or somehow get over this barrier. And we resolve that problem and we're very pleased because we've made a big step forward, we've worked out this problem and 
what we've done is we've opened up to another problem. Now there's a new problem, which wasn't there before. But now that this old problem has been resolved, this new problem has now presented itself. So immediately I have to start working on this new problem. And I finally resolve the new problem, and then there's another problem which opens up. It's never finished. And if I look at the never finished quality of it, it can be very frustrating. I'm always working on a problem. But when I look back, I realize that I've solved all these problems and as a result, my meditation is much more skillful, much deeper, much more satisfying than it was before. But there's always a problem. When we're doing a retreat, it's like it has a very in-your-face, claustrophobic feel to it sometimes because we're just aware of the problem. It's only when we step back that we realize, sure, of course there's a problem, but this is different from the problem I used to work with. Or it might be the same problem, but I'm working at it at a deeper level. So there's something going, there's something moving. Meditation is a craft which takes time to learn. So some things we fall over, we fail at, but later on we will work it out. But we have to be patient with it. Meditation is a long-term project. We don't have to become expert at it in just the first decade. This is, this is why it's always good when people start young, uh, because they've got many decades to go. <laughs> As for the rest of us, well, we have to be in a bit of a hurry. <laughs> we can console ourselves that there's always next lifetime, <laughs> and the one after that, and the one after that. This is the, uh, the Buddha's teaching of life after life, I think is very important because it tells us we don't have to solve every problem in this lifetime. We don't have to reach perfection. All we've got to do is take a step along the path and we'll get there. Satipatthana has this quality, this universal quality. It embraces everything. We need some kind of method to get in there, to start doing it. So this is where the techniques come in. I sit here and I talk about primary object, secondary object, note this, note that. And this is, from Mahasi Sayadaw's point of view, what you tell to beginners, people who are starting out. You notice that with primary object, secondary object, what it tries to get us to do is to actually practice the fact that anything can be a meditation object. I'm following my meditation object and something happens that prevents me from meditating. As soon as I recognize this, that something becomes my meditation object. So this is what it's teaching us. It's teaching us anything can be a meditation object. I can't meditate because dot, dot, dot. This is my meditation object. Here it is. It's just been presented to me. The universe has wrapped it up in paper and given it to me as a gift. Now again, it's not easy and it's not necessarily that we can do it the first time or the second time or even the third time. But this is the direction that the practice goes in. If you have, um, and somebody pointed this out to me many years ago, somebody said, look, if you have a a room with, say, 20 meditators. And every single one of them, the only meditation practice that they've ever done has been the same method and they've all learnt it from the same teacher and they've all practiced it together. You will find 20 different kinds of meditation going on in that room. Everyone is different. Everyone. Now, over time, those differences become bigger and bigger and bigger. Each one of us takes the basic method and sends it off in a particular direction. And the direction, I think, is set by two things. First of all, our obstacles, our hindrances. What gets in the way? 
What prevents me from meditating? That's what I have to work with. And in working with it over time, I become expert at it, and that takes my meditation in a certain direction. One um, senior monk, when I was practicing with him, this is before he was a senior monk, he was very junior then, I was practicing with him in Burma, and uh, he said, you can always tell what problems a meditation teacher has had in their meditation practice. It's what they talk about the most when they teach. Because that's how they've learned. When I teach meditation, I talk about distraction a lot. Can you guess what problems I have? <laughs> I talk about thought a lot as a meditation object. We haven't really got to it yet in a couple of days' time. Because I was a chronic thinker, my mind would never shut up. So I was faced with the choice. I either give up meditation because I can't do it, poor me, or I learn how to use thinking as a meditation object. That was the choice. And so my meditation heads off in a certain way. Now there are other people for whom thinking is not a particular problem. And their meditation heads off in a different way. Our obstacles will determine which direction we go. The other thing that determines the direction is what interests us, what we find interesting. It's much easier to be mindful of something we find interesting than something we find boring. If you have some aspect of your experience that stimulates your interest, then I always recommend go for it. Use this as your meditation object because you find it easy to stay with it, to track it. Your mindfulness will develop your effort will be there because you're interested, quite naturally, and your samadhi will naturally develop. And of course, sometimes the obstacle is also what is interesting. I might be interested in the obstacle, what's getting in the way. And this can happen in all sorts of ways. One meditator I knew was a very strong woman, very dedicated practitioner. And she was talking about how she began her meditation. Years before, a friend talked her into coming along to an introductory meditation meeting. She was not really interested, but she was going there with her friend. And the meditation person running the, the evening goes blah, 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 and then says, now we'll do a little meditation practice. I want you to sit there and breathe and be aware of your breathing. And this person was thinking, God, that's ridiculously simple. What's the problem with these people? So she sat there and tried to do it, and it was absolutely impossible. Couldn't do it for two seconds at a time. And she was absolutely outraged that she could not do, do it. She was so angry <laughs> and, and was determined that she was going to keep working at this until she succeeded in doing it. And so it was frustration and anger that got her in. She was interested because she wasn't used to having something, something simple that she could not do. She was very capable. She wanted to do something, she did it. But this thing was defying her. So it got her hooked. And so off she went. So it can be anything, any, any kind of relationship. It's very interesting, the different relationships that people have to meditation practice. The Buddha here is describing the practitioner. Here, a practitioner surrendering longing and dejection for the world lives tracking body as body, ardent, clearly understanding and mindful. Firstly, the basic action, as we said, is tracking. This is anupasana, seeing, pasana, anu, along. Seeing along, tracking something over time. Studying the flow of experience. Now again, it varies according to the method. You might have the method where you come in, you sit down for 45 minutes, I will track 
my breathing. You might even be more specific. I am going to track the rising and falling of the abdomen. Or it could be completely general. I'll sit here and I'll be completely open and I will track whatever happens as it happens. I don't care what it is. Or anything in between. But what they all have in common is I will track this experience as it unfolds. I may do it sitting in a meditation hall. I may do it pacing restlessly up and down outside. I may do it while taking a walk. I may do it while lying down in my bed. These are accidental aspects. The important thing is the tracking. This is the central activity of Satipatthana. Secondly, you notice that the practitioner lives tracking body as body, tracking mind as mind. This verb is in Pali is viharati, and it does translate exactly as lives. In other words, this becomes our normal dwelling place. When the Buddha is talking about meditation, sometimes he'll talk about it in terms of an attainment and a dwelling place. Do you know how if you're meditating and for some mysterious reason it's going well, so you sit down and suddenly everything is clear and there's no or very little thinking and the meditation object is very clear, very peaceful, you just stay with it, no problem, very simple. And this lasts for five minutes or 20 minutes or an hour even. Let's say you sit for an hour, that was very good, I finally figured it out. Now I understand how meditation works. It's so simple. So, of course, you reward yourself with a hot drink, look at the view, and then come back, and it's going to be very easy, very simple. You sit down in complete chaos. The mind is in total rebellion. So you look back at that experience, and maybe you don't have it again for five years. This experience is an attainment. An attainment is something we attain, we get to, but it doesn't last, it disappears. We lose it. We get it, but we lose it. So the Buddha would say to attain something, and then he might say to attain it and live it. Now this second one is, instead of being something that happens on the odd occasion, this becomes my natural, habitual state. This is living my normal habit is in this case to be mindful. So the Buddha is saying it's not good enough to come into, a, into the hall and have a nice samadhi experience. That's useful but what we need to do is to make mindfulness itself habitual. So we're talking about a way of life in which we make it our habit to examine, to track our experience as it unfolds. We've been talking about it in terms of mindfulness as to remember our experience, reminding ourselves, this is what it is, this is happening, it's this now, now it's this, it's changed to this. And making that a habit of reminding myself about my experience. Sometimes I forget. When I forget, often I'm lost in some kind of thinking. In my case, I notice when this happens, what sometimes reminds me is that I become physically clumsy. Just little things, just like I might stumble against something or I might drop something or I might forget where I put that. And that reminds me that I'm no longer tracking body as body. I've lost contact with the body. I'm in this world of thought. So I realise that and I come back to the body. This is one reason why posture is so important, including movement. When you move about during the day, usually the instruction is slow down be slow. And that's good advice. It helps calm us down, it helps develop samadhi. 
But don't just be slow, be graceful. I think the grace is more important than the speed. That helps us to stay with the body, to track body as body. See yourself as dancing through the day. Those of you who do Tai Chi, Qi Gong, I think you've got an advantage. Treat the whole day as an exercise in Tai Chi. Develop a sense of grace in your movements and that helps to keep you in the body, mindful of the body. This tracking body as body, mind as mind, is something that becomes a habit. It's not just a meditation technique. It's a way of life. The practitioner lives surrendering longing and dejection for the world. The Buddha mentions this first. Longing and dejection. Abhijja and domanasa. Abhijja, sometimes translated as desire, which literally means a leaning toward. You know how it, when you, let's say if you're heading down the stairs to lunch and you're quite looking forward to it, you know how, particularly with steep stairs, you've got to be careful because you might find yourself unconsciously leaning toward the bottom of the stairs and maybe fall over. When we want something, it's like we find ourselves leaning toward something. And in that leaning toward, we lose our balance. We lose the centre and lean out in order to grab at something. This is abhijja. It's a loss of balance within ourselves because we're leaning out to get something else. Desire, longing. There's no exact equivalent in English, I don't think. And domanasa refers to any kind of mental pain, any kind of mental distress. Any time when what is happening is not what, what we want to be happening, we have domanasa. And it's the shadow of desire. If we translate this as desire and grief, if there's desire, there's grief. If there's grief, there's desire. If there's longing, there's dejection. If there's dejection, there's longing. Why is this? If I want something, I want something else, which means I don't like what I've got now. If there's desire, there's grief. If I'm losing my balance because I'm trying to get something, then I'm discontented with what I have. Grief, sorrow, is the shadow of desire. They always go together. The Buddha describes the practitioner as surrendering desire and grief, uh, longing and dejection for the world. Letting it go, letting it go, letting it go, letting it go. And we find ourselves doing this all of the time. It's particularly obvious, I think, at the beginning of a retreat. When we start doing a retreat, we enter into this new world at the retreat centre. But it's, not, it's new, but it's not quite real yet. What is real is the world we left behind. That is still reaching out to us. Usually our thoughts in the first couple of days of the retreat are dominated by the past. The world we left behind is more real and so we have longing and dejection regarding that world. That's the world which is disturbing us. And so our job is, when this happens, is to let it go, to surrender it. Let it go, let it go, let it go. You could look at this in one sense as a willingness to forget. A willingness to forget the world that we've left and to focus on this world instead. It's very interesting that towards the end of a retreat, the longing and grief turns to the future. And the future world becomes much more real. What's going to happen when we get home? That's much more real than what's happening now. Again, longing and grief. Longing and dejection, desire and grief for the world, this time in the future. And again, let it go. Let it go. Let it go. It's not here now. So let it go, let it go, let it go. Or it can be longing and grief for what's going on now. I want something else. I don't like this sitting period. It's too hot. Has anybody noticed it's too hot? 
and I can't sleep properly? How can they expect me to meditate when I can't sleep properly? Why can't these people get aircon? What's wrong with them? So this is, again, longing and grief for the world. Of course it arises. And the Buddha says, just let it go. Just let it go. Just let it go. Let it go. Let it go. And it's an ongoing process. So letting go of that, one lives tracking body as body, mind as mind. Now what does he mean by body as body, mind as mind? What he's getting at is what we might call intimacy to be fully engaged with a particular experience without separating ourselves from it by our thoughts and projections and ideas about it. So this morning we're doing the elements. No, yesterday, that's right. I have an idea about my breathing, about how it works. And I understand that I'm supposed to follow my breathing. And so I sit down and I start to look for something. Now what am I looking for? What I'm looking for is my idea of how the breathing should be. It's not the actual breathing. And perhaps I get frustrated and so I make something happen. I'm, I'm not supposed to breathe up here. I'm supposed to breathe down here. So I'll, I'll just push, push. Okay, now I'm doing it. Now I'm doing rising, falling of abdomen. Rising, falling, rising, falling. I'm a good Mahasi yogi. But it's, oh God, it's awful. <laughs> have to take a break. And what is dominating is my ideas, my concepts of what it's supposed to be. I'm supposed to be doing this. It's, and I know it's like that. I am not tracking body as body. What we were doing this morning in those exercises, the experiments, is to try to trick ourselves into seeing, well, what is it? So, for example, one question that I would like to ask is, how do you know that you're breathing? And often when I ask a meditator this, they, they give me a funny look. Are you for real? <laughs> and sometimes they say something like, well, I'm alive, aren't I? So I must be breathing. So I know I'm breathing. <laughs> yeah, but that's all in the in the concepts. But what's the actual experience that tells you that you're breathing? Now, I have a very problematic relationship with breathing: lifelong asthma, bronchitis, etc. And I've noticed that sometimes I forget to breathe. I forget to breathe at the slightest provocation any kind of stress and I'll immediately stop breathing. And I went for decades without even noticing this. I just never noticed it. My concept told me, of course I'm breathing. But actually, a lot of the time, I wasn't. I was getting tangled up in stress over something and my, all my attention was on the situation and I never noticed that I had actually stopped breathing. Then I start to pay attention and I realise, well actually sometimes I don't breathe and that's not a good thing. And sometimes I do breathe. It's a quite different relationship. It's much closer to the reality. Sometimes when I'm sitting, I have a classic Mahasi style rising and falling. When I was in Burma, I got very, very good at it because I, I was training at it. Since I left Burma, I've been a lot more slack about it. I don't worry about rising and falling. I just breathe. And sometimes it's down here, and sometimes it's here, and sometimes it's here, sometimes it's here and here. And so it can be all over the place. Sometimes it doesn't feel like breathing at all. There are just these movements in the body. How do I know that I'm breathing? There's movement. That's what tells me that I'm breathing. I can feel movement within the body. When there's no movement, I know I've got a problem. I better start, start it moving again. So I ask myself the question, how do I know that I'm breathing? On the surface, it's a stupid question. 
But when you look at it, it's a very useful question because it's designed to get us from our normal habitual thought world down into what is actually happening. What's the actual experience now? Let's say I suddenly realise that I'm really angry, irritated. How do I know that I'm irritated? What tells me this? Well, there's a story in my mind. Someone did something that they should not have done. Another thing which is happening is the body is all churned up in some way. Then I realise actually there's a relationship between the body being churned up and the narrative. And sometimes it's the, the mind wants to make meaning out of the fact that the body is churned up. And so it interprets it by saying, oh, you must be angry at someone. And then it goes through the filing cabinet under A for anger or I for irritation, goes through the files and picks out something. Here it is. This is what you're angry at. This person. Last week they did blah, blah, blah. I look at a normal everyday experience and I find that there's all sorts of things happening underneath the surface. Some of it is physical. The body is churned up. Some of it is mental. There's a certain story going on. And there's a relationship between the physical and the mental. They're feeding each other. And this is a whole complex network. And it's creating a world which I think is real, which when I look at it, is definitely not real. It's no more real than watching television. This is tracking body as body, tracking mind as mind. It's about getting underneath what we think is happening to what is really going on. And this is a fundamental movement of the practice. This is one reason why I often talk about the importance of curiosity. As I said, one of the characteristics of the meditator is must be willing to live with failure. And another characteristic is something actually it was said very neatly by Noam Chomsky, the ability to be puzzled by simple things. The ability to be puzzled by something very simple is important for the meditator. I'm sitting here and I can't meditate. Very simple. But the ability to be genuinely puzzled by this. Isn't this interesting? What is going on? Something is going on. Last week I could meditate. This week I can't. Something is going on. So what is it? I'm very interested here. I'm very curious. So I start to look. And that very looking is the meditation. I am already meditating. It might not feel good, but I am already meditating. The curiosity, the interest, the investigation, that in particular the willingness to investigate the simple things, the obvious things, the things we take for granted. One story that I like to tell, I was reading a book written by an Australian historian about the history wars in Australia some years ago. I think they're happening all over the place. This is the Australian version. The battle over the past. You know, what really was the past? In Australia, it was summarised as the black armband versus the white blindfold view of Australian history. The black armband view is Europeans, let's face it, the British, came 200 years ago and slaughtered everybody and took their land. The white blindfold view is these noble British people came and brought civilization to an empty continent. And the battle between these two views of history so these are the history wars. This is a gross over oversimplification, but these are the history wars. And I was reading this book that was examining this whole cultural phenomenon, and in the course of it, they quoted one of the most, one of the more 
distinguished Australian historians, Geoffrey Blaney. He was saying how what the historian does is they take the records left behind from the past. They study these records in order to find out what was going on back then. And he raised the question, what is the one thing that people never record? What is the one thing they never write down? Now some of you are writing down notes. What is the one thing during this retreat you will never write down? It's the obvious. It's what is completely obvious to you. What you write down is what is new, which you haven't thought of before. Oh, that's interesting. I never thought of that. I'll write it down. But what you don't write down is what is completely obvious. So if you're a historian and you're looking at the past, the hardest thing to find is what was obvious to everybody living at that time. It was a very interesting comment, but I thought, actually it's true of meditation. The hardest thing for a meditator to see is what is most obvious. Because we just take it for granted. We never think to question it. It's too obvious to question. And that is what blinds us every time. So the ability to be puzzled by simple things, the ability to start to look at the obvious and start to question it. We often, we're looking for the esoteric, but what we need to look at is what's most obvious. That's what we don't see. So this is all about becoming intimate with the experience, to take ordinary everyday experience and to really look at it, really examine it. What is it all about? What does it do? How does it work? To become interested in it, curious about it. This is what drives the meditation practice forward. And this is tracking body as body. It's just body tracking mind as mind. And it has the flavour here of what the Buddha calls anatta, not self. I'm experiencing something and I automatically relate to it as mine. This is my thought about my world. And that means it's special. But what if it's not mine? What if it's just a thought? to track thought as just thought. And what is it exactly? How do you know that you're thinking? In a couple of days we're going to do an exercise in that very, using that very question. So I won't anticipate. To drop beneath the surface of what we normally think things are and to start to really experience what is it exactly? How does it work? What is going on here? What is this about? These are all aspects of tracking body as body, tracking mind as mind. And it takes us right into anatta, into not-self. We'll talk about not-self later in the retreat. But just to point out that this practice is all about anatta from the very beginning. When I see a thought as just a thought, not my thought, it's just a thought, this is practicing not-self. When I see a sensation as just a sensation, not my body, just a sensation, this is practicing anatta, not-self. So the practitioner surrendering longing and dejection for the world lives tracking body as body, ardent, clearly understanding and mindful. So this practitioner has three characteristics. She's ardent, she's uh, clearly understanding, and she's mindful. So we've been talking about mindfulness, this capacity to remember the present, reminding ourselves of the present. And let's look at the other two. First of all, ardency. In Pali, atapi. A similar word is tapas, which covers the austerities that Indian 
yogis do. Be classical lying on the bed of nails. This is tapas. And it all, like, all, all these terms come from a root meaning heat. The idea in uh, yoga tradition is that when one does a spiritual practice, one generates an inner heat, which is equivalent to power. One generates inner heat and creates a great deal of power. The heat could be literal, the body can become hot, the mind can become hot, or it could be just metaphorical. And this heat is, one way of looking at it, is the heat of passion. What the Buddha is talking about here is passion. The practitioner needs to be passionate about what they are doing. Passion is not something we normally associate with meditation, but it's very important. It's a difficult practice. It's a very simple practice, but it's very difficult. And to do meditation practice, we need to be passionate about what we're doing, to be really want to do it. Motivation is very important. If we really don't want to do it, it's not going to happen. We need that passion. Now, passion here is not necessarily an emotion. I suspect if we ask most meditators, do you really feel passionate about your meditation right now? The answer would be no, I don't. But you notice that we keep coming back. People will come to a retreat, have a hard time. Oh, that was hard. So good to get to finish it. You know, often people are high at the end of a retreat and I think a lot of that is a sheer relief that it's over. And you, you walk away thinking, oh God, that was hard. I've graduated. That's enough for me. But a year later, you find yourself going back again. Back for more. Now within 24 hours, you're regretting your decision. But you're here. What brings us here? It's passion. It's not necessarily a feeling. It's not necessarily, necessarily an emotion. But it's something that brings us back, that draws us in, that we can't quite let go of. Even when we feel like we're a complete failure, I can't do it. Impossible. And yet we find we come back for another go. Why? It's passion. This is the ardency that the Buddha is talking about. And without that ardency, it's the fuel that drives us forward. And of course, it has a lot to do with effort, the effort the, that we put into the practice. This is where it comes from. It comes from this ardency. Ardent clearly understanding. This refers to sampajanya, the wisdom aspect of the practice. Mindfulness is associated by the Buddha with wisdom. And sampajanya is clear understanding is a kind of basement level wisdom. If I'm tracking my experience over time, I learn how it behaves. Let's give an example. Let's say a couple get together and they get married. And they've been together five years, ten years, twenty years. During the course of a marriage, you study your partner, don't you? You get to know your partner. Perhaps this is the person, apart from your children, you know most of all. If you have children, you study them. You follow them, you track them throughout their lives. You really get to know them. You get to know them because you've been tracking them so well. So you develop a wisdom and understanding about that person. Sometimes you might shock a child or a partner when you say something quite unexpected that shows that you actually understand what they're doing more than they do. We know our partners and our children. We know them because we've studied them over a period of time. This is Sampajanya. If I study my own experience over a period of time, I get to know it. I get to understand it. I get to understand how it works, what it does, when it's a good day, when it's a bad day, when it's time to go forward, when it's time to pull back. We've been talking about it in terms of very uh, basic meditation decisions. Sometimes it's good to move into the object and be more precise and more detailed. Sometimes it's better to pull back and go wide with the awareness. Sometimes it's good to be more precise. Sometimes it's good to be less precise. Sometimes it's good to sit. Sometimes it's good to walk. And these are decisions that we're making all of the time 
and we become more skilled in our ability to make them because we are developing this sampajanya, this clear understanding. So this is this clear understanding is associated with mindfulness. If I track my experience over a period of time, I get to know it. I get to know what it does. And in doing so, I bring that knowledge to the meditation practice and I become a much more skilled practitioner over a period of time. Here we've just gone through that uh, particular sentence describing the practitioner. And again, the basic activity is tracking experience over time. We track body as body. We track mind as mind. This is becoming intimate with the experience, not being satisfied with what we think it is, with what we perceive it to be, but actually going right into it. What is it exactly? And what drives us forward is this ardency. We're interested. We're curious. We want to know. We have to know. And associated with this is understanding. We get to know our experience over a period of time and at the centre of it is mindfulness. Remembering the experience. Again and again, we forget. Again and again, we remember. And that's at the very centre of the whole thing. 